Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I heard the news of the verdict in the trial of the members of the Proud Boys on charges of seditious conspiracy. And there was a couple of references to the Civil War period. And I became curious to know what exactly happened during the Civil War period, what sort of changes happened in the law during that time that is connected to today. And so I went to my go-to source to maybe get a little bit of a sense and try to get some idea of the connection. And I must confess, I am not an attorney and law is not a, a strong point for me. But I thought, well, let me let me look at it as a layperson and see if I can get some sort of an understanding um, of the law. And so I went to newspapers.com and found a really interesting article in the New York Herald. And I have to say, going in, I had an assumption that uh, Jefferson Davis, who was pictured here in a, a fairly rare albumin print from the John O'Brien collection. I thought that maybe Jefferson Davis was tried under laws that were developed during the Civil War to address seditious conspiracy. And of course, it makes perfect sense considering the war was going on and the country was trying to understand how to deal with the results of it. And so what I found in the New York Herald was unexpected. And I want to read it to you because the article seems to be, maybe not seems to be, it actually addresses uh, an assumption that the American public is also wondering what's going on. So this article dates from 1866, during that period when the announcement was made that a trial was going to happen. And as students of the Civil War know, Jefferson Davis never went to trial, but still the question of the law and what this meant in the potential future case of Jefferson Davis was very much part of the public conversation. So let me read this article to you, which I think is as useful to, I imagine was as useful to readers in 1866 as it might be today. So here we go. The article is simply titled Jeff Davis. The secondary headline is the points of law involved in his trial. So here we go. The recent references to the trial of Mr. Davis have called public attention to the subject, which very naturally in a large degree interests the public mind. The indictment in the usual form for treason, has been found by the grand jury in the United States Circuit Court at Norfolk. Mr. Davis is indicted under the Act of 1790, under which the penalty on conviction is death. He could have been indicted under the Act of July 31st, 1861, there's your Civil War reference, for seditious conspiracy, there's that term the punishment of which is a fine, not over $5,000, and imprisonment with or without hard labor, not over six years. One of the most important points is the drawing of the jury who are charged with the trial of the prisoner. The jury is to be drawn according to lot or otherwise, according to the mode practice in the state for selecting juries for the highest courts of law. The number of jurors is to be summoned is left to the discretion of the court as is common law. The act of July 16th, 1862 repeats so much of the act of 1790 as requires in cases punishable with death that 12 jurors be summoned from the county where the offense was committed. Under the Act of June 17, 1862, no person is allowed to sit on the jury who was in any degree of complicity with the rebellion. This is an act of controlling importance because it ensures that the trial shall not be before a loyal jury. 
or pardon me, shall be before a loyal jury. Mr. Davis cannot be tried by any of his Confederates. His fate will rest entirely with his political opponents. The jury must be unanimous or there can be no verdict. This is the invariable rule of the common law and has existed time whereof memory of the man runneth not to the contrary. The article goes on for a little bit longer, but my understanding of this is that Jefferson Davis was going to be tried under the Act of 1790, which was pretty severe. So 1790 Acts, which I believe were eventually um, eliminated around 1800, early the first decade of the 19th century. But they were pretty severe, these charges of treason with the death penalty attached to it. So in 1861, part of these confiscation acts that defined the law or maybe brought them back a little bit more into play. And there was no surprise, the date of July 1861, the war has been underway for a few months. The federal government is trying to understand how to prosecute folks who are in rebellion to the United States. And so you've got these 1861 acts. They are in 1862. And at least based on my novice reading of this document and doing a little bit of additional research online, it looks to me like there was a combination of bringing back some of the Act of 1790, at least the penalty portion of it, and then acting on the 1861 Act with the caveat of pulling the jurors from the 1862 Act that had to be loyal, loyal to the Union jurors. So it's a little bit murkier and muddier than I thought. I had this idea that it would be much cleaner cut and connect directly with today. However, if you do a little bit more reading, the Acts of 1862 morph over the next 150, 160 years to what they are today. So I have a little bit better understanding of what seditious conspiracy meant in 1790, 1861, 1862, and how they tie to today. So that's it for today's episode. We will see you in the next one. Take care.